Hi, I'm Sarah Hill. I'm the CEO of Bookster. I am here with the lovely Keo Stark. Hi. She is the author of the book, When Strangers Meet, How People You Don't Know Can Transform You, a subject that I find very fascinating, and I'm sure you will too. Um, as we sit here and ask her some questions, please feel free to ask questions in the comments. We're fielding your questions right now, um, actually, and uh, so feel free to have any, if you have any questions for Keo um, about the writing process or about her book, When Strangers Meet, um, to put those in the comments now. So Keo, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the writing process? Sure, yeah. It's, it's really interesting to talk to an audience that wants to hear about that. Um, so I think one of the things about this book is that the topic is something that I had been obsessed with and reading about and you know, carrying out in my life and teaching about for a long time. And so sitting down to write the book was a, a sort of winnowing process of, you know, what's the most important thing here? How do I convey the meaningfulness of these interactions? Um, so one of the things I decided to do was to include little stories of my own interactions so that it wasn't just me kind of telling you this is what it means and this is how it works, but for you to really see in uh, it more, it's not that it's fiction, but more kind of lyrical, uh, literary nonfiction kind of prose, you know, what those experiences are like for me. That's great. Um, can you tell me what provoked you from having this happen into your real life to write an actual book on the subject? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think to back up, um, I come from a family where everyone talks to strangers. Um, you know, I grew up in kind of a medium-sized town. It wasn't like the big scary city. Um, my dad was a city planner and my mother was a nurse in the emergency room. So they were both people who dealt with strangers all the time and were really accountable to them. Wow. So, you know, my dad is dealing with people's backyards basically and my mom is dealing with people's bodies. And, you know, you have to learn to listen and connect with people in those situations. So I had this really interesting sort of role model. Um, I really enjoyed those interactions as I grew up and I got to the point where I was like, oh, not everyone feels this way about talking to strangers. Mm -hmm. Like suddenly, and you were saying before that you know your mom and you also talk to strangers a lot. So yeah. I know that you get it, but believe it or not, not everyone is clued into it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. I have been reprimanded by like friends and like all kinds of people for talking to strangers. But some of my favorite conversations and most enlightening conversations, as you mentioned, have been from people that are different than I am and yeah. who have, you know, let me in a little bit into their life, whether it's a taxi driver or uh, somebody sitting next to me at the airport or whatever, yeah. you know, it's just, it's awesome. It's so, it's so interesting. I'm glad that you're talking about it. Yeah. Well, and that was the thing for me is, you know, once I started to notice that not everyone was doing this, I felt like, okay, I have to think about why and why is this so meaningful to me and why do people avoid it and sort of just what's going on. And so then I started not just really observing closely, but also, you know, doing research about from sociology and psychology and also city planning actually has a lot to say about this because mm -hmm. city planners in general want to design sociable spaces. They want to make public spaces where people do interact because they have the sense that that is good for the civic life of a place. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up teaching about this first and then eventually coming to the point where it was like, okay, like people beyond my students and my blog readers need to know about this. It's really important. And it was becoming more and more politically important as well over the you know few past years. Yeah, so absolutely. that was part of deciding to do it. I also have to admit, you know, for years people have been suggesting that I do this. And I was nervous about like, what kind of book is this? Is it like a pundit book? Is it, you know, this sort of lyrical something or other? And I finally hit on the idea of it being very compact and including both, uh, you know, factual analytical information along with these personal stories that would really kind of bring it together. And I feel like, you know, short is good in this yeah. situation. Like it didn't have to be sprawling and overly documented and stuff like that. 
did you find the writing? I, I have two questions for you. And sure. again, um, feel free to send us questions for Keo. Uh, she's a plethora of knowledge and can um, feel, answer your questions on what, what's it like talking to strangers? How do you get out there and start doing it? Um, all of those things, feel free to leave it in the comments and then we will get an answer for you. Um, one of the questions I have for you is, what was the, was it difficult to get a publisher with this idea? Uh, did they think it was radical or were they like, oh, this is, you know, oh, this needs to happen already? Why isn't sure. it Sure. Yeah, I think it was very much like this is of the moment. It, the, the actual writing of the book was quite quick for a book. Um, yeah. You know, it was, I think, the first draft was something like three months. And part of the reason I was able to do that is because I had sort of years of thinking and writing yeah. and reading about all of this. But it was very much like, okay, you know, we're dealing with more and more intolerance. We're dealing with a world in which we're realizing that, you know, people don't know anything about the way that each other are living. We're living in a moment where you know, the justice system is broken. Yeah. People need to understand that the way that they live is not the way everyone else lives. And so it was just really like timely, I think. So timely. I was actually, I had a little bit of a cold and I woke up last night at like 3 a.m. of course and was like, oh, I'm just gonna get on Facebook because I can't stop sneezing. And I got on, <laughs> why, why not, you know? Yeah. Bad idea. Bad idea. And, and I got on, and uh, I, since I'm from Texas, I found some, uh, there's a woman out there. She's a um, reporter, and um, she's very radical. She's, she's from almost, you know, she's filming in Dallas, Texas, which is close to where I'm from. And she's super, super, super radical. And... I was like, I'm actually going to force myself to listen to this because... Um, radical which way? Radical um, in, in the sense of, you know, she's far right-leaning. Okay. Um, and I wanted, I've never listened to the, I mean, I have, but I haven't really listened. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to hear what they have to say. She's very accusatory of liberals. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, okay, I've never heard, like I've heard the liberal side of being accusatory, but I've never mm -hmm. heard the other side. And anyways, long story short, I listened to it and um, was really inspired by that. And I think that one of the things people need to do is not only talk to people other than themselves that um, are, think in different ways and actually listen to what those people are saying, but read books that are about, you know, mm -hmm. things that aren't, yeah. aren't, uh, necessarily your own being. Sure, sure. Um, but I think, you know, when strangers meet, that's the perfect way to introduce those subjects in such a weird time. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. A divide. It's like, talk to your, talk right. to the people. Right, right. Uh, well, and I think, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is that there's a kind of dual importance and uh, dual explanation of the meaning of these interactions. And one is that it, there's a very personal, individual, emotional connection that you're making with people, even in the briefest interaction. You know, you say hello. Someone told me this morning about somebody bought her a coffee and it you know, made her feel kind of buoyant all day. I had a great conversation with my taxi driver on the way here this morning. Uh, you know, we're here in New York City and he was asking me why I was going to Wall Street. And so then we got in a whole conversation and he was telling me about a children's book he's trying to write for his kid. And oh, wow. I mean, people tell me a lot about the books they're trying to write. And this one actually sounded good. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm rooting for this, you know, <laughs> like this is great. The other dimension is this sort of political dimension. So you're doing two things at the same time when you're open to talking to strangers, when you greet someone like a human, like an individual, rather than sort of looking past them on the sidewalk. You're opening up an opportunity for your own momentary feeling of almost intimacy, and you're opening up for both of you a space where you could potentially have new understanding of what it's like to be a person who's not you. That's beautiful, um, like such a beautiful mission. And also that just reminds me that um, Q also has a TED talk about this that has had over two million views. I mean, it's, it's big. I was surprised You're a big that. deal. That's a big <laughs> deal. Like that's a lot of people. And 
what a cool message because now there's two million people out there in the United States that all are thinking, hey, I might talk to a stranger and what maybe you the person next to you has seen the same video and like now you both know, hey, we're talking, you know. I was actually surprised. Oh, I just touched the mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was surprised at how little flack I got about this from the internet. I mean, yeah. I, I think they're, you know, on sort of posts on Facebook and stuff like that, that Ted did, there are a fair number of people saying, that's ridiculous, don't do that, that's unsafe for my kids. Um, but I didn't really look at those yeah. just to protect myself. Yeah. But I only got one person who directly tweeted at me that I was an idiot and Ooh. you know, like stranger danger was real. And well, idiot is like nothing compared to what a lot of people get called, particularly yeah. women, I was fine with it. Yeah. Um, but I was just shocked that not more people were arguing with the idea that it's good to talk to strangers. In the book, I talk about modeling for my child, she's five, that it's okay to talk to strangers, that the thing to do is to teach her, like, how do I decide which strangers are okay to talk to? Um, Again, you were saying, you know, your mom talked to strangers all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sure what you picked up on was not just that it was okay, but like how she was making those decisions. Like yeah. kids learn everything from how we model for them, not what we tell them. Yeah, um, so. I don't know how she does it, but she has like this magic ability. Like she ended up talking to Eli Manning one time on accident and having wow. a great conversation with them and, and all kinds of people. I ended up getting my first gig right out of college because of somebody that my mom talked to um, who was a stranger that she just met and yeah I mean I think that's like it's been it's been really bizarre <laughs> <laughs> but amazing you know I keep like scratching my head she was flying somewhere the other day and she was sitting next to someone on a plane who just published a book and and we're gonna end up doing an interview with them oh, so, great. Yeah. yeah that kind of stuff yeah. is just really absolutely. interesting absolutely um, so we have a ton of questions and okay. I've asked you mine, so very selfishly, but, um, and, and please feel free to send in questions. Again, we are looking at them live and giving them to Keo, although I've been doing a bad job because I have a lot of questions for Keo personally. <laughs> um, first we have, who would you suggest read your book? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, the first answer is everybody. Um, another answer is nice guys who want to be able to talk to women in a non-romantic, non-hitting on them way, just like to have a real human interaction. It's really important to understand all of the subtle dynamics of what's going on if you're gonna do that. It's important for everybody, but it's especially important, I think, for men. Um, so there's a whole, the, the second half of the book is all kind of breakdown of sociologically, like how are these interactions working? What are the dynamics going on? Like, what do you have to be aware of? Um, so that's one thing. Um, honestly, also, I think it's really important for white people to read because uh, the idea of being aware of differences in how people's lives are led and what it means to be them is much less obvious if you're white. Um, you know, if you are a person of color, you know very well that, you know, people live differently from you. They don't necessarily understand your perspective. So those are two kind of audiences beyond everyone. Yeah. Um, I also think that it's a very empowering book for women to read for similar reasons um, because of getting a sense of the sort of more subtle dynamics of what it's like to talk to strangers, what it offers and how you can work your way out of situations that you don't feel comfortable in. Yeah, that's great, that's great advice. Um, all right, we have some more. And again, feel free to send in questions. We are giving them to Keo as you submit them in the comments. Uh, we have, do you have any advice for someone who feels awkward talking to strangers? And I would think this book is probably full of advice <laughs> for that, but off the top of your head. Sure, yeah, um, I mean, one answer is if you're not some, if you have like social anxiety, I'm not going to say go out and try it. Yeah. Um, but if you're shy or you just feel awkward, um, you know, the book has a bunch of different strategies that people use, whether they know it or not, for opening up a conversation with a stranger. One piece of advice I have is if you want to practice, go somewhere that you don't live or that you don't work. Go to mm -hmm. some other neighborhood and try it out there because there's 
pretty much no consequences other than you feeling awkward. You're not gonna run into the people again who you've tried this out on. Yeah. Um, and the more you have positive experiences, the more confident you're gonna feel about it. Um, the other thing is that if you actually do open up a conversation, you know, stay away from things like the weather, which at this point, talking about the weather turns pretty quickly into a political conversation because the weather is so weird that everyone <laughs> is talking about climate change. Yeah. But traditionally, so true. it's kind of a shut down subject. Yeah. Um, what I was just realizing recently in a lot of my conversations is that talking about food goes straight to the meaning of life. You know, if you talk to somebody about what they're eating or what they cook or where they eat, or, you know, if it's somebody who comes from somewhere different than you do, like what is the food like in their home country um, or what do their parents cook or any of these things it just goes straight to the heart of stuff and it really opens things up. So I, I'm a big fan of food. I also lean over in restaurants and ask people if their dinner is good, um, <laughs> which, you know, you get mixed results on that because it is a little intrusive, but I still enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, but then at least you get to, you know, they would feel like, okay, my meal not only did I eat it, but now I get to talk about it. You know, yeah, if they like it, they're always excited. Yeah, so. or if they even if they don't like it, <laughs> like, okay. yeah, yeah, don't that. do it. <laughs> okay, um, we have how has technology influenced the way we talk to strangers? I think that's such a fantastic question. It really is, and you know, with this book and what I've been talking about around it, it's very much about our interactions in person. One of the things that I talk quite a lot about in the book is the ways in which we use our bodies in these interactions, both as how we make decisions, so we're using our senses uh, to figure out who to talk to. We're getting a lot of sensory information really quickly and, and interpreting it. Um, the other thing is has to do with a kind of physical synchrony that we fall into relatively easily when we're open to talking to someone, and that can lead to a kind of comfort that really opens up space for disclosure. Mm -hmm. So the body is really important in all of this. And I think, you know, the way that we communicate through technology, the body is missing. And so we have to develop different kinds of cues for how we interpret people. There is the, you know, the anonymity problem of, you know, people being just vile on, on Twitter or on Facebook or on social media because there, there aren't the consequences of being physically present, of having to see someone's face. Right. There's a lot of people who say vile things on the internet who would say them to your face as well. Yeah. But I think that you know, the fact that you're not seeing the effects of what you say um, are, are somehow mixed up in how things are different, for sure. It's interesting because I have noticed for like, you know, the new update on Apple, the emojis are becoming more and more lifelike. And I'm yeah. like, no matter what they do, it's not going to be a person. You you can put emojis in text, and it helps set a tone of the. Con it can yeah. help set the tone. Yeah. Um, more so than without the emoji, but you know it's really interesting. Yeah. To think about. I agree, and I think we have not gotten anywhere near figuring out how to communicate tone and subtlety on the internet in email, in yeah. text, whatever it is like. It's constant misunderstanding. Yeah. Um, and you know, for me, I was in kind of a snotty way opposed to emoji for a long time because I'm old enough to have used a lot of emoticons, and I was like, <laughs> "What is this?" So now it's a whole language that it baffles me. Yeah. Um, and I can't, you know, I'm like, "What does that mean?" Yeah. That they put the pink heart instead of the red heart yeah, like yeah. I don't know yeah um and you know there's like 50 different smiley faces and yeah it's all lost on me yeah um, <laughs> because I was being a snob so my own fault well you know there is a dictionary an emoji dictionary I I think that you are an excellent communicator I would guess <laughs> uh you probably don't even need emojis but you know they do they there still isn't yeah that doesn't help and it, and you can't talk to strangers through technology we I guess you right. can but usually you kind of stay in your own little bubble yeah um, well so. and when you do it's often to express mm -hmm. an opinion yeah. that is either agreement or disagreement you know those can be done respectfully or disrespectfully um, but that way of actually connecting is really rare
Yeah, I mean that. I really feel like we could talk for like a few hours on that subject. Totally, it is totally. So and it's not even at this point my you know my area of expertise. I feel like there's <laughs> other people who um, really spend a lot of time taking that apart. But I can definitely talk and think a lot about this the difference for sure. Interesting. Um, again, please send in your questions for Keo if you have any questions on her writing process or about her book. When Strangers Meet. Um, we have plenty of questions here and I will try to get to them all. Uh, right now we have, um, do you have any good anecdotes about talking to strangers? Oh my God, I have so many anecdotes I could talk all day. Um, it, you know, it sort of depends on like what sort of picture you want to paint. There's a lot of anecdotes in the book about different interactions that I've had with strangers. Um, I, I do have a newsletter that is those kind of stories. Um, so that's another place to look. Yeah. But you know, the, the conversation I had this morning in the cab, um, that the reason we started with food and got into the meaning of life was, um, you know, like he asked me what I had had for breakfast. And I don't know why he asked me that. And that's, if you've ever been uh, on the radio, that's the standard question when they just want you to talk to get the sound levels. They always ask you for what you had for breakfast. And I was, I it was kind of jarring when he asked me that. Yeah. Um, there's another guy I talked to recently who we had a very intense conversation that has stayed with me, um, which started out because he's from Egypt. And I said something about Egyptian food and that I liked it, and he said, oh, you must love lamb, and I told him I didn't eat meat, and suddenly we were in, you know, like, that he had slaughtered the sacrificial lambs himself. Oh, my gosh. Um, and then into religion, and, you know, it's, like, amazing. Yeah. Um, so you just kind of never know what you're going to get out of people. Wow, that is really interesting. So what did you, what was your reaction when, when he told you that? You know, I mean, I was, like, fascinated, yeah. and mostly I wanted to know what it was about for him. Yeah. Um, but also, I mean, people don't get listened to very much in the way that we live right now. So if you're listening to somebody, you know, you don't, you ask one question and they start going and you get a lot of stories from people if you're quiet in yeah. the conversation. So. Cool. Um, we have so many great questions. Thank you guys for your questions and feel free to ask um, more for Keo if you have any. Um, okay, how do you deal with negative interactions with strangers? You've touched on this a bit, but is there kind of a... Sure, a yeah. Um, I think for me, I've been doing this for so long and I have such a consistent kind of positive feeling about it that I can kind of let it roll off me. Sometimes in a really bad situation, it takes a few days, you know, it'll really like be under my skin. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that's very, very interesting about this, um, sociologically, there's something called the contact hypothesis, which is, in general, that you know, the more contact you have with people who are different than you, the more tolerant you are, the less prejudice you have. One of the things that, uh, and this is a theory that you know, there were experiments over like 50 years, and then relatively recently, people started to go back to that and understand what happened with a negative interaction. Mm. And what they found is that a negative, sorry, a negative interaction had so much more weight than a positive interaction mm. that it really could increase prejudice. And so I think for me, one of the first things that I try to do after I've had a bad experience is like take a deep breath and say, you know, that was one person. Like that was not yeah. everyone. Um, somebody wrote me I can't remember where it was. I think it was a response to something on Facebook all about how they, oh no, it was uh, somebody wrote like an editorial in a Chicago newspaper that was uh, all about how I was wrong and how she had tried it. And then this one bad thing had happened and she was like, so forget it. I'm never going to do that again. And if I was about to respond and then I looked at the comments and all these people had jumped in and said like, look, you know, that sucks that you had that experience. It was one thing. So I think, you know, part of it is I, it's not even forgiveness. It's like just like recognizing that you don't want that to weigh so heavily on you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think for every bad interaction that you have, I would imagine that you would have hundreds, maybe even yeah. more positive ones. Yeah, for me. But I definitely hope 
that people can sort of be open enough to not get shut down by that. But I have every sympathy for somebody that it really, you know, turns away from this. Sure. Um, okay. This is a very, very tough question, uh, but a very good one. Um, what is your favorite story from a stranger that you'll never forget? Oh, I thought it was going to be a different kind of tough question. <laughs> no, no. Um, let me think about that. That's such a good question. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think this is a hard story, um, and it happened like 20 years ago. Um, I was sitting outside a bar and waiting for a friend, and this guy who was clearly something was wrong, he was kind of talking to people who weren't there, uh, sort of walked by, there was nobody else around, and something just told me, you know, my well-developed instincts that this guy was not dangerous, mm -hmm. and he was very distressed. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure what to do, and I looked at him and I, was, I just said, are you okay? And he was like, no, I'm not. I, you know, I can't get away from these voices. I know their voices, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Um, and he started talking and he was telling me about how, you know, he stayed with his sister, but he couldn't stay there when he was in a bad way because of her kids. He didn't want them exposed to that, you know, because he didn't have an address, he couldn't get a job, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the problems he was having. And I just, I said, would you like to sit down? Aww. And I, you know, I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, like, that sounds really hard. You mm -hmm. know, I'm sorry you're going through this. And then my friend who was meeting me came up and looked at what was going on and said, what are you doing? Like, come inside. And I just thought, what, you know, like, I just treated this guy like a human and she just treated him like a danger. Yeah. And I, it was heartbreaking. And, you know, this was um, at the beginning of a lot of, uh, mental institutions closing down yeah. and people getting put out on the street. And I just thought it, it was so meaningful to me. It was such a sort of object lesson in what happens when her culture doesn't take care of people. Um, so uh, obviously I'm like getting choked up talking about it. Yeah, like that one beautiful. really stayed with me. Um, yeah, that's outstanding. I get it. Like yeah. I'm definitely one of the those people too. It's difficult um, because you end up you're like, oh, okay, I can just walk by or I can stop and yeah. kind of assess the situation. And if you do, sometimes you can really have a positive impact on somebody's life. Sure. I'm sure that that guy will, I mean, I could be personifying my own like desires for yeah. him, but I would hope that that helped him in yeah. some way. Yeah. Um, well, and it goes both ways. I mean, it yeah. helped me and, and, Obviously, it was such a meaningful moment for me, you know, and I mean, there's a side to altruism that's very selfish in yeah. a certain way where you see someone in distress and you feel their distress and you want to alleviate your own distress as mm -hmm. well as them. Um, and I think I started to understand that as well, like not that I think of myself as selfish, but just how complex yeah. being a kind person actually is. Absolutely. Definitely. It's beautiful. Um, again, if you guys have more questions, uh, please send them in and we will answer them. We have, um, well, I think this kind of answers it, but what's something important you learned from your interaction with a stranger? Yeah, I mean, I think, sorry, let me talk to you. Um, <laughs> I think definitely the, you know, the story I just told is a lot about that, but yeah. I mean, it's also... Um, this story is in the book, but I, you know, I think of myself as this totally tolerant, open person with no prejudices, no preformed expectations of people. And of course, that's ridiculous. Um, and I remember talking to this woman once in a bodega who was wearing a scarf, a hijab, and um, I had dyed red hair at that point, like fire engine red punk hair. Mm -hmm. And she told me she liked it and that her daughter's uh, always wanted to dye their hair and that she let them do it with food coloring. And I, I thought, oh, and I imagined her daughters with all of this under their scarves yeah. and their veils. And I said something to her about veils and she said, they don't wear veils. You know, that's, 
going to be their choice. You know, oh. she said, I tell them what I believe and what I think is right. They have to make their own choices. I can't make their choice for them. And I thought like, I was so wrong <laughs> and not just wrong about her, but like I was making assumptions about Muslim women who were wearing veils that their worldview was really different yeah. than I assumed it was and that it was not complex. So, I, you know, that that's one that also stays with me for that kind of lesson. That's a great one. Um, okay. We have another one here. We have, so you adopt the behavior you suggest in your book. Um, do you practice what you preach, basically? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I, pract I practiced it before I preached it, um, for sure. Uh, and I think one of the things that I practice and preach is taking risks. But, you know, I don't, how do I say this? I want people to take small emotional risks when possible, not physical risks. Yeah. Um, but the more that I've been encouraging people to do this, the more I've been pushing my own boundaries of what's comfortable and you know what seems, again, not physically dangerous. But you know, what am I opening myself up to if I talk to this person? Um, yeah. You know, what is there? What do I have to lose in this? And being aware of, usually, I don't lose whatever that is. When you talk to a stranger, is there a possibility that you will become friends with them or maybe like just pen pal kind of thing or? You know, like for me, I'm really interested in these moments that are totally fleeting, um, that, you know, have, there's nothing to do with friendship or relationship forming. It's about that particular sense of intimacy. That said, I've become friends with people who turn out to be my neighbors uh, or, you know, who right. ride the same bus as me every day with my daughter or things like that, um, who are clerks in, in restaurants that I go to a lot. There's a woman who's the uh, waitress in the restaurant that is like my sort of local and, you know, we know everything about each other's lives, but I don't know whether to call her a friend or not because I don't know where she lives. Yeah. I, you know, there's a lot of like friend stuff that I don't know about her. Yeah. And, it's still a service relationship, you know, yeah. no matter what. Um, it feels very genuine to me and I think to her, but, you know, there's always these kinds of context. So it really depends on what you want to mm -hmm. make of it. Um, but again, I think the beauty of this is in this kind of, you know, briefness. Okay. Brevity. Great. Um, all right. We are going to do one last question and Thank you again, Keo, so much for your time here. This we is have, great. We have, um, we've touched on this a little bit. Um, actually, we'll do two questions. Uh, one of them, the first one, so you reach out to strangers on the internet. Do you reach out to strangers on the internet to gather information? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, um, when I first started doing the research for writing this book, I did put out a sort of open call on my internet, which is not gigantic. Um, you know, do you talk to strangers? Do you have any good stories? Kind of to get, uh, to kind of clock, you know, what other people's experience is. That said, that's a totally, you know, skewed sample in statistical terms. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. And I, I don't think that I really reach out to total strangers on the internet very often. You know, if somebody is like a friend of a friend or a journalist or, you know, someone who is publicly open, I might ask them a question if I have a question or like tell them I liked something. Um, as a writer, it's really nice when people say nice things about my writing on the internet. Yeah. Um, so I'm always really grateful for that and I usually like thank them um, and engage with them. And I also try to do that for writers that I enjoy. Um, I think it's one of the amazing things about being a writer now is how much you get to connect with your readers. Because it's a lonely thing. I'm sure every writer who's here says this, but like it's a very lonely thing. Like you're in your head. Even if you're <laughs> yeah. in a cafe, you're in your head. Yeah, you know? it's like, isolating. Yeah. So hearing from people that it, that it has meaning to them is just amazing. That's great. Um, so we have can you touch on why talking to strangers is so important during our political climate? Should politicians talk to strangers more? And I think we've sort of answered the first part of that question, but mm -hmm. I love the second part of that question. About politicians, yeah, yeah. About politicians and strangers. Yeah, that's an amazing question, actually, um, because I think politicians think of it as their job to talk to strangers all the time. 
but their constituents only. You know, the, their job is to get reelected, I think, you know, and we're seeing this more and more. And, you know, if you're concerned about what's happening in the country, the thing to do is be very local and, you know, talk to your representative and your senators and call them on their local phone lines when you want to say something to them. Mm -hmm. um, I wish politicians found a way of listening to people who aren't just the people who are going to elect them, you know, and who they are responsible to in that way. I wish they felt like they were responsible to everyone in a really different way. And that takes a kind of listening that, that they might not have time for. Yeah, so. I completely agree. That's great. Well, Q, thank you so much for coming on again. Yeah, thank you and great questions, everybody. Yes, and thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for your questions. We uh, don't forget to pick up When Strangers Meet by Keo Stark. Uh, Keo also has a few other books out. I do, yeah. Um, what, are, what are those? Uh, there's an independent learning handbook for people who want to learn outside of school. And then I have a novel that actually started from some true little anecdotes about people in my neighborhood that I had had interactions with and started to feel like, oh, this is the setting for something. So then I wrote a novel that's all totally made up. Beautiful. Uh, and what's the name of it? That's called Follow Me Down. Follow Me Down. Okay. And then um, do you have a website and you talked about your newsletter? How can people? Sure. If you go to, it's keostark.com and there's a sign up for the newsletter there. All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Thank you guys again so much. It was nice to see you.